Welcome to episode six of Civil War Breakfast Club. I'm your co-host, Mary, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Darren. Hey, Darren. Good evening, Mary. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, it's been wonderful. Great mood today. Yes. Beautiful autumnal night. Autumnal? Autumnal night? Is that, what, is that a phrase? Uh, uh, autumnal. Autumnal. Anyway, but happy for, autumn. Happy autumn. Today's, uh, is it, today's the first day of fall, correct? Officially? Yes, it is. Even though we record this on Tuesday, which is the 22nd, yep. and this will drop on whatever Saturday's date is. And I always mean to look, but I never do. But yeah. how, how are you? How was, your, how was your weekend? It was excellent. I thought we had a really good Facebook Live on Saturday. We did. We totally it did. Fun. It was nice people to drop by a long one, too. It was like two hours. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. So um, every, if this is your first episode, every Saturday morning around 10, we do a Facebook Live as a sort of wrap up from whatever the week's topic has been um, from the episode that we've We'll drop eight o'clock on Saturday morning. So for instance, this week we were talking about Antietam. So we will do a Facebook live about Antietam, but sometimes we kind of get off topic and all that. And we just talk civil war. So it's basically, you get to come hang out with two civil war nerds. So you got literally your morning beers, morning beers. We have nothing else to do on a Saturday morning. Yep. You want to hang out with us and we can all be, <laughs> we can all be pathetic together. Hanging out for a while, talking, <laughs> and, talking about history. And when I remember, which I didn't this past Saturday to hit the record button, um, I will post it as an episode. So it'll go out to like iTunes and all that. And it will be on our YouTube, YouTube channel as well. But this one isn't because I forgot to hit record. She, she, has, she, has she has her good days and she has her good days and she has her bad days with I the just, technology. I got McClelland. That's all. You must have tried to use your math skills to help figure out the uh, recording this time. I did. Hmm. I totally did. My lack of my Mary McClellan math. Mary, Mary Mac. Mary, Mary Mac, Mac math. <laughs> anyway, so last time we talked, um, it was talking about the lead up to Antietam. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be a great idea to actually talk about Antietam today? I think so, yeah. It's a couple of days after the 17th of battle. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, the anniversary, the 158th anniversary of the single bloodiest day in American history, um, 23,000 casualties. We will talk about that. We're going to talk more about some of the stories and some of the outlying issues around Antietam. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really, you know, I don't know about you, Mayor, but the idea of talking about gun placements and line closers and all, I don't really care. Yeah, so, no, no. I think, I think the thing that we want to do with this podcast is because, I mean, there are other civil war podcasts out there that are talking about you know, like where the guns were placed and all those. And I, I do listen to those as well. Um, but I think just because that's kind of been done before, you know, we're going to look at more of like the human side of it. Mm -hmm. um, just some of the stories around it. I mean, we're obviously going to talk about the different phases of the battle and all that, but there's some really interesting stories associated with Antietam. Yeah, we'll talk about all three phases. We'll talk about the cornfield. We'll talk about the sunken road and we'll talk about Burnside Bridge. But we're going to talk about some of the, the other stories, some of the personalities, some of the other fun tidbits that go into the story that is, I think we both agree by running our mouths on Twitter this week, that it's probably the most important battle in the Civil War. Yep. yep. And if you have any complaints, you can email Mary at CivilWarBreakfastClub.com. The one that takes care um, of all the emails. The I will not call you a fucker, though, like I call Darren a fucker all the time. All the time. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I never, I've never got the finger more in my life than all this time I've got to know you. But anyway, um, we're going to talk about that. But I think before we do, well, we got to talk about beer first. Yes, right? we do. Yeah. We'll talk about beer first. We'll priorities. We'll yeah. Talk about the beer. And then we'll talk and we'll kind of talk about the very lead up to, we're not going to go into painful detail of how we did last week about this, but just we'll kind of just summarize real quick of how we got to Antietam. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk about what happened at Antietam. And then we'll talk about maybe some of the stuff that happened afterwards on the political scene and the social scene. And then, um, and then we'll drink some more beer. Yeah. We'll call it a night. Yep. Sounds How do you good. feel about that? Is that work, work for you? Sounds good. Yeah. All so right, what so are you drinking tonight? I am drinking Harpoon Duncan Pumpkin, which is really, really good. I'm and I thought it was only appropriate to drink out of my Antietam coffee mug. Nice. Because we are the a breakfast club per Matt Calorie wanting to know what the hell we're having breakfast stuff. <laughs> so therefore, I'm drinking a Dunkin' Donuts beer. Okay, Matt? Breakfast. There we go. <laughs> That's awesome. Matt, Matt, we were, we were, 
Matt had his on his addressing Gettysburg podcast uh, last week. Um, it's a really Matt. excellent podcast that he does, and he's a really fun guy. You can find him on Instagram. Actually, he does like Instagram live videos and stuff. So we hung out with him a little bit on Sunday night, which was pretty cool. It's important to us to help promote the other Civil War um, mm. podcast, especially his he his addressing Gettysburg is maybe my favorite. Yeah, you know, favorite, I just because, I because he's he's a good dude. He does he does good work. He has a good sense of humor, and um. If it's an inexplicable reason, he likes us. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, we like him, so. Oh no, he's, a, he's a great dude. He's, he's a great awesome. dude. So ch check him out. Check him out. So what are you drinking, Mayor? I'm drinking uh, called Doc Produce Bobcat, which is from a local brewery here called Cowbell Brewing, and oh. they like they do. So there was a few characters that lived in this town of Blythe, which is about 20 minutes away from Godrich, and this Doc Purdue guy was a veterinarian in the late 1880s, and he collected exotic animals including a bobcat so they're it's e, their west coast red ale which usually i drink ipas but i decided to switch it up tonight and have this one so i can't remember the last time you drank something that's not ipa i know yeah well i've got an ipa for after, for my second beer because i usually get to two beers in this podcast second and third and fourth and yeah <laughs> and how this goes this depends on how much you annoy me tonight weeks <laughs> well you better start drinking <laughs> Uh, it's going to be one of those days. Okay, yeah. fine. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about Antietam, or as some yeah. people like to call it, Sharpsburg. Mm -hmm. Okay. So last time we talked, we talked about the lead up. Now, we talked about the morale of the Union Army, the political disaster that was the White House and the military with Pope getting bounced after Second Manassas. We talked about how they had no choice but to bring back Mac as the field commander, much to the chagrin of the cabinet. They hated it. But it did spark the Union Army. It did fire up the troops. Um, you know, stories of Mac is back, Mac is back. You know, guys and horses rode through the lines. So it, 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 as far as instant morale goes, it was certainly one that, um, that really, that really um, fired them up anyway. Now, a lot of the flaws of McClellan will ultimately show in this battle, which they tend to do. Um, Jim was only 36 years old. Yeah, he's, he's one of the I, younger I, ones. I read that recently, and I was surprised that he would. I thought he was older. Yep, yep. I don't he's think one, he was. He's one of the. I don't think he was ones. George C. George Green old as dirt dirt, but I thought he was. <laughs> I thought he was. He was pretty old. I thought he. I thought he was or, like in his forties. Or Sumner old. Oh yeah, Sumner old. We'll talk about yeah. Sumner here in a little while. Yeah, he'll make he'll make an appearance when we talk yep. about the uh, the West Woods here in a little while. So, yeah, very cool. Okay, so anyway, give a little bit of background, and then um we'll talk about it. So everything's going basically right for. The confederacy at the time mm. i mean let's be honest they're, they're winning and they know they're winning they come off of a big win at second manassas robert e lee he takes over on june 1st 1862 and ever since then he sees nothing but success he pushes the union away from richmond he goes off and pants john pope at mm -hmm. second manassas he knows he has the union over a barrel he knows that the 1862 midterms are coming and he knows that if he can go into the north and he can get a really big win couple of things might happen. You might see some more northern will disappear, which is what his ultimate goal is. But there's also the specter of international cooperation from England and France. Now, yep. Lee never thought it was going to happen, admittedly, and he's been quoted saying he never expected it, but it was there. And as you study more about Antietam, you realize um, that it was closer than maybe they thought it was. Yeah, because there was a letter written in Britain to, I think it was a guy with the last name of Palmerston. Palmerston, who wrote the day of the battle. Yep, yep. And the he said, I battle. think we need to um, look at possibly recognizing these guys. He says, with one more big win, yep. we may have to recognize them. One more big win. Yep. So again, you look at the how many fourths and tens the, the Union has, had converted on. Freaking Patriots. Oh, my God. Was, that, was, that was my fault. I thought of that. But basically, um, the 4th of September, Lee invades Maryland and they're riding high. You know, they're, they are sky high. They're going into the North. They're going to live off the land. Same as the Gettysburg campaign that they're bringing the war from Virginia into the North. They want to set up camp. They want to supply. They want to cause all kinds of problems. There's rumors. He wants to go towards Harrisburg, um, which is ultimately what they were going to do a year or so later, but they're sky high and they know they're winning. The union is, not sky high, but the soldiers are high because they got McClellan back. 
So you take a look at some of the, the, the things we talked about before. It was a risky move for Lee. Mm-hmm. It really, really was for him to, for, to go into the North for the first time. Up to that point, they'd only defended. They'd always played defense. And in the Civil War for the, for the Confederacy, all they had to do was defend. Yeah. All they had to do was defend and run out the clock. That was the goal. Mm-hmm. So for him to make a northern push, um, it kind of it took you know it took balls. It really it really did. Um, but he needed to he needed to go to the north. He wanted ultimately to go to Pennsylvania. Uh, it's basically just get up there and do that. Well, I wonder if one of his reasons was because he didn't think that Lincoln was going to put McClellan back in charge. You know. Well, I think he probably did though because I think he did see what was going on. I mean, no one knows, maybe. Yeah. But I think whether he knew McClellan was back or whether he didn't, it was Burnside or it was going to be whoever, um, I think he knew the opportunity was there to do something. I think he felt they had him in some sort of disarray. Yep. So it's kind of like when a, a football or a baseball team fires their coach. You want to get that team right off the bat because yep. they don't know what the hell is going on. Um, and I think that's what he thought. But I think he gambled quite a bit. Now, we talked before about foreign intervention, Yep. right? So when you hear foreign intervention in the Civil War, you're thinking of France and you're thinking of England. Um, and they were going to back a winner. They couldn't afford to back a loser. Um, ultimately, obviously, it didn't fail. Um, the, the, the amount of cotton that was being lost in England and the, oh. and for them was gigantic. Yeah. It's, almost, it's, it's, it's as if, you know, this, this country or your country um, about oil. If they got a huge oil disruption, cotton prices were, were jumping. Um, they they had you know economic issues because mm-hmm. of this. They needed to settle it one way or the other. Um, and but they had a couple of skeletons in their closet too. England banned slavery in 1833, France in 1848. So you knew that they weren't going to be able to back a confederacy that that basically had the, the institution of slavery if the war was about to become about mm-hmm. slavery. Yeah. Up to that point, Lincoln himself was saying, look, I don't care. You want to keep your friggin' slaves? Keep I don't give a shit. We're just keeping the union. But if this war turned out to be about slavery, that was going to be it for them. Yep. Yeah, and so, um, so you have leading into this battle. And we talked before about South Mountain and Harpers Ferry and all mm-hmm. that. But Lee sets up his camp in Sharpsburg. He's going to play defense, and that's ultimately what he's, what he's going to do. Um, Lincoln, simply put, could not afford politically or militarily to have a Confederate victory in Maryland. Nope. Nope. And this is why we said before why it's such an important battle. Yep. I, you know, in my opinion, I think yours too, I think the war probably ends soon after a victory for the Confederacy in Antietam. Absolutely, because it's going to be a victory. If it's in Maryland, it's going to be in a border state. So that's huge right there. You also have the congressional elections. Again, another factor that's playing into it as well. And you also have, and we will talk about this more at the end, but this is going to be one of the first battles that is photographed. It is going to bring to the American people, especially those in the North, because the photos are going to be exhibited in New York, it is going to bring the carnage of war so they can see it. Mm-hmm. They're seeing those photos after a loss. It's going to make it that much worse. So there's a lot hinging on this battle. And I mean, we, we talked about it with a few people on Twitter, and there's many different opinions around there. It was such a, it was a, I found it to be a really, really interesting discussion why people thought you know, if it wasn't Antietam that they thought was the biggest battle, what they thought the biggest battle was and why, which is one of the things that I enjoy with what we're creating, you know, with this well, community people, on Twitter. People always fall back to Gettysburg and they fall mm-hmm. back to Vicksburg. Yeah. But what they don't realize, Gettysburg is Antietam 2.0. It is. It's, it's, it's Antietam, the revenge, you know, dude was my car number two. That's what yeah. that was. Well, yeah, there's so it, many different stepping stones in the Maryland campaign, as well as the Gettysburg campaign, that you can draw a lot of parallels between. You know, you don't just go from like Second Manassas to to Antietam. Like, there's all this stuff that is happening in between that. Um, same with you. Don't just go like from Chancellorsville to Gettysburg. There's all these little stepping stones that are happening that are allowing Lee to get further and further in, into. Um, Pennsylvania, which we discussed in a few other episodes, you know, particularly like the Battle of Winchester, where that basically allows Lee to, to get to Gettysburg. Um, same with like 
you know, South Mountain is kind of the same way. It's what is allowing Lee to get to, he's going to go to Sharpsburg after that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Gettysburg campaign and the Maryland campaign are almost the same thing if you think mm -hmm. about it. It's just more guys. They're going yeah. to restock the army as far as food goes. They're going to win in the north. They're going to take the battle out of Virginia. Uh, it, it, there's so many parallels. Really, Gettysburg was was the extension of what he wanted to do in Antietam. He wanted, you know, basically you could have Gettysburg a year before. It would have been it would have been in Gettysburg. It would have been somewhere near Harrisburg, realistically. Mm -hmm. But hanging over this whole thing with Lincoln is he's got this Emancipation Proclamation in his back pocket, and he knows this is probably his key to keeping France and England out of this war. Yeah. But he, but so he goes in front of his cabinet, you know, and he basically says, you know, here's what I got. Friggin' do it. And obviously they don't, they don't agree with him at all. Um, July, 1862, he meets with Seward and all, all his cabinet guys. And, and they, they admittedly and probably correctly felt that if they issued the emancipation proclamation now, meaning right, right before, um, you know, right before Second Manassas and right in that whole area of the peninsula, that it was going to look like a desperate move. You know, Seward had that quote. He says it was the last shriek of a retreat. That's what yeah. he says it probably would have been. And he's right. You know, Lincoln had, you know, he had his kind of wishy-washy on slavery kind of all along with it. But I think he knew at this point it was important. You know, he looked back to his 1858 speech uh, with the nomination, the House Divided Against the Cell speech. Um, it had been in the back of his mind. He knew you could not permanently have free enslaved states. And I think he probably saw this as a flashpoint that maybe if we can get this victory, because he knew it was coming because Lee was baiting him. He, he's marching in the north. He's in, he's in Maryland. He knew that he had to go get him. Um, it was dangerous for, for Lincoln, though, because mm -hmm. he could not afford to lose Maryland. No. So if the Confederates got into Maryland, and this is all Maryland's a state where they, you know, Lincoln himself had suspended habeas corpus. Um, he, you know, he did a lot of things to piss off the people of Maryland. Yeah. If Lee had got in there and got support and was able to stay in Maryland for a long period of time, it's not inconceivable that um, that may it may have flipped. Well, yeah, they could they could secede at any time, and then you know the problem with any of the border states that like Lincoln had to keep the three there's three border states. Hopefully, I'm getting that right. Has to keep every single one of them happy because if one of them goes, the others are probably going to follow with them. And the border states are still states that have slaves, but they have not seceded. They've chosen to remain loyal to the Union. Maryland was different though because you lose Maryland, DC is completely surrounded. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Maryland you know? was, and and it was like, you know, Maryland is the place where a lot of the stuff from the Lincoln assassination, which you and I are both very, very interested in. We we're definitely going to be doing some episodes about that. Um, you know, a lot of stuff happens with that there. But yes, absolutely. Like like DC will be surrounded, and that's mm -hmm. not that's not good for morale either. You if know? DC gets surrounded, the official the official military phrase is foobar. Yep. That's the official phrase. Does okay. that stand for fucked up beyond all recognition? Mary, Margaret, that month. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that is why we are an explicit rated podcast. It's completely again, because of me. There's a reason why Mary and E sound familiar because she, then once again, another explicit E next to this podcast on iTunes. Thank you very much, Mary. Appreciate it. As always supported. I'm going to start adding an E on the end of my name. So it's kind of, going to, then it'll be, it'll be spelled the exact same way as Mary's Heights. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Um, I'm impressed. You know what Fubar stood for though? I don't know why I didn't think you would. I knew you probably would, but I've oh, one, of, one of my favorite, one of my favorite movies is Saving Private Ryan. And they mention it in that. That's right. That's right. Another one movie. Uh, um, so we there's a lot of risk, obviously, with that. But Lee's also thinking of the same thing with Maryland. He says, if I can get up to Maryland, maybe I can, I can get these guys to flip. But what happens when he gets there is the people in Maryland see this army. A lot of these guys have no shoes. They're starving. Mm -hmm. They're foraging. They're saying, this sucks. And that these Maryland people are like, I don't want to get involved in this. So I think based on the fact these dirty, wretched Confederate people who've been living off the land and scourging for food and are literally starving, I mean, would you want to sign up for that? No. I don't think so. No, there was no. some reports of them eating at some point during this campaign green corn. Like corn that was not ripe. That's not a good day for you. That's gross. Yeah, that's, that's not good at all. You know. No, thank you. That's not gross. 
you you could not you could not eat that. I mean, you could not be a Confederate because you couldn't have your chicken and your chicken salad. How would you how would you make that happen? Excuse me, sir. I need my chicken and greens. Jeez. Hey, there were some reports that um, well, not reports, but one of the things that the some of the Union soldiers were reduced to eating at this time was a mixture of coffee grounds and sugar. Mm-hmm. Sounds good, actually. I'm like, wow. They were drinking corn coffee, which sounds horrific. Yeah, and it, like the hard tack fried in the bacon fat. Although if you made corn coffee with pumpkin, I'd drink it. I probably would too, actually. I would. <laughs> like I probably would. You would pumpkin anything. You'd I'll, I'll, oh, yeah. I'll drink that. Pum- pumpkin basically needs to be a, a year round. Yes. Somebody on this podcast actually tweeted that. I think it was moi that it needs to be a 12 month thing. I think it was me, actually. No. Okay, whatever. Fubar. I think it was both of us. I think, I don't know. It, was the, day, it was the day I went to Starbucks. Anyway, so we go off the rail again. So, so at least thinking, okay. Maybe it's maybe think something positive happened in Maryland. It doesn't really turn out that way, but he was surprised in the campaign when we talked about Special Order One Ninety One and all that stuff. I'm not going to yeah. get into that again. But Lee was legit surprised. McClellan was aggressive. Mm-hmm. I think I think he was. So he set up that perimeter right around the Antietam Creek. Um, but it was risky for him because the way his army was situated, I mean, it was a quasi Gibraltarish type thing. Mm-hmm. But he had the creek in front of him and he had the Potomac behind him. And so the tip, so he had freedom was on the other side of the Potomac. So he was in a precarious, one of those three syllable words, four syllable words, uh, position if he, um, if he got in trouble. So he actually thought that he'd probably attack on the 16th. There was a little slight skirmishing. Some people actually think the battle of Antietam was a two day Mm -hmm. battle. You can, I'm sure you can find people to talk about that, but we're going to leave that alone. Meade was involved in that, wasn't he? I think. I think you. I think he was, but I know it, it was. You know, west of Sharps, west of yep. the battlefields. Um, there's some monuments out there for that, mm-hmm. but really, it was really dawn on the um, on the 17th. Yeah. So the sun the sun comes up on the 17th. McClellan wants to push the Rebs out. He wants to get them out of there. He decides he's going to hit their right flank. He's going to start in those cornfield with the first yep. corps, and he's going to drive them. He's going to try to drive them. But what's his problem? Oh. Can't, can't see them. Doesn't know where they no, are. No. He knows they're out there somewhere. Yeah, right? and that's because the roll there's like Antietam is very rolling, like like hills. I've actually been in the cornfield before too. As a matter of fact, so was I. I got lost in the cornfield a few months ago. You and I were both in the cornfield. I had to help you out via video. <laughs> and it started to rain like it always <laughs> does when I'm in Antietam. But yes, um, I got lost. I got lost in the cornfield in Antietam. I was and it's actually going to be Gibbon and his Iron Brigade that are some of the first to go into. Mm-hmm. the cornfield so let's 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 take a peek at that so with the sun rises on the 17th of mm-hmm. september 1862 okay and um what happens next they start to make their way to the cornfield although there are some opening shots fired first of all mm-hmm. by the confederates so hope- as they're eating their breakfast um so the Confederate, good point, the Confederates, have, you know, they're about to have their breakfast. The first yep. Texas Hoods guys, are, they haven't eaten in two, day, two days. They finally got food. They're cooking. Right when they're about to eat, right about to, about to eat, they hear the guns. Yep. And they're like, you've got to be shitting me. It's like Mary when she doesn't have her coffee in the goddamn morning. <laughs> the, the mood they must have had. Ornery. So now these first Texans have to get up and they've got to fight. Okay. So... Coming through the cornfield in the first corps under Joe Hooker is the second and the sixth and the seventh and the nineteenth, second and sixth of Wisconsin, nineteenth yep. Indiana, also known as the what? The Iron Brigade. The, the Iron Brigade. Can we call 20... them Iron Brigade now? Yeah, we can do. We officially call they, Iron Brigade. Yeah, yeah they earned their name at South Mountain. They're not going to get the twenty fourth Michigan until just before Gettysburg. Yep. And if they had the mission guys, they probably would have walked right but, through this thing. We well, they still that. did. Gibbon still did a really like. Now it was. Yeah, I think he had to it was a tough decision for him to make, but at some point he sees some rebels off towards where this clover field is. So he has two of um, the regiments has them lay down on their stomachs in the cornfield. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he sends the other two to deal with the rebels that are off in the clover field. And I think, I believe Rufus Dawes is one of the men that is on his stomach in the cornfield. They made, they made a movie about that clover field, didn't they? It's not the same thing. No, I thought it was. <laughs> yeah. 
New Civil War movie, Cloverfield? Cloverfield. I hope they were in a fucking Cloverfield. <laughs> I think that's what I heard. They were in so, the they were in so say. They were in so they were in some field. They were in a they were in a clover field. They were in a field full of clovers. But I'm on my second listen through a fierce glory by by Justin Martin. I okay. really hope I we'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about books later, I bet. I bet you we tell I think so, yeah. As, as the do. Queen of the North enabling is gonna drain my checking account again for Amazon. So we're not gonna get into too too deep of the battle, but basically the first the first core um and basically the 12th Corps Mansfield is going to be behind them. They're going to be coming through to push them out. And it's going to be absolutely brutal. The cornfield itself is going to be basically completely obliterated in the first hour. Yep. The Union guy is going to be coming through without seeing it. And the Texans are going to unload on them. Uh, the Hoods guys are just going to absolutely unload on them. Georgians. And they're just going to basically end up being a brutal, brutal fight. This is October, or September rather. And the stock is high. It's harvest time. Yeah. So just pitch, just imagine that situation where you're a Confederate, right? And you see them coming, you hear them coming. You don't know how many there are. You don't know who the hell they are. And then picture you're a union guy. You don't know if the whole Confederate army is 10 feet from you or they're not even nearby. Yeah. And you're flat on your stomach in a cornfield yeah. and you could still get shot. Like there was men that did not, when they all finally stood up again, you know, you could stand up and then like three guys next to you are not getting up because they're dead. You're dealing with soldiers, scarecrows, everything else that's clowns. hideous and a co clowns, everything else in a cornfield that's, that's probably just, it's a scary situation. But within the first hour, they all be obliterated um, and it ends up being obviously really, really, really bad. It's, it's, a, it's wave after wave. You've got the, the Iron Brigade coming, you've got the Confederates pushing back and it's wave after wave after wave. Um, just... Just picture the din of the battle, loud artillery going off. The these guys can't communicate. The, the commanders can't get their orders out. Um, it's just truly, just a truly killing field. And, um, and it's one of those places, if you go, you can still feel it. I mean, Rufus Dawes, he was a major in the 6th Wisconsin at the time. Uh, we can talk, we'll talk about him if we have already. I can't remember. But he had that quote of this, whoever stood in front of the cornfield in Tietum needs no praise. That was a crazy a praise, a quote he had. Mm -hmm. um, Basically saying, you know, this, this is about as brutal as it gets. And the only reason why the Union ultimately wins that little first part of the, say little, the, first part of the battle is because the Rebs kind of ran out of guys. It was just a pure, pure war of attrition. Mm -hmm. 9,000 casualties in the first three hours in yeah, that battle. And just the, if, that, if, if the battle didn't ended right there, it'd be a strong battle. I stayed Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that, Except this was more hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mm -hmm. Something about, you know, just, something about not knowing where the guys are, not seeing them, that had to have been brutal. It, it just had to have oh, been. Well, when I visited there with my friend Laura, you know? took me on a, a tour there because um, she knows the battle inside and out. She actually lives there now, which is really awesome. Good for her for fulfilling her dream to do that. Um, but it's like, it's rolling hills and like, so she had me stand where Gibbon would have been and she said, you tell me what you could see. And I'm like, nothing. Like, I, I couldn't tell if they were like, I would just be like, oh, it looks clear over there. But then she's like, it's a rolling hill. So you start to walk over there and they're all down, you know, mm -hmm. where you can see them. It's undulations is what you call them. Okay, sorry, not rolling hills, undulations. Undulations. Thank you. I'm trying, to, trying to class it up here, Fincher, okay? I'm trying to make it a little of a higher level here. Raise the bar. Who died and made you the geography doctorate? I don't know. Same person made the math doctorate, I suppose. <laughs> and it's shocky to know I have my PhD in math. Wouldn't that would surprise <laughs> the hell out of me? <laughs> wow. Anyway, so, but it doesn't. It doesn't just end the cornfield because it. You know, you have a situation where these bunch of Louisianas get along get along the Hagerstown Road, which is yep. right adjacent to it, and you've got the 19th Indiana and the 7th Wisconsin. They sneak behind them. And these guys are literally 10 feet from each other, firing each other, bang, 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 bang. Just literally this complete mayhem. Um, ultimately, the Union will push them back. And it kind of ends that first phase of the battle. And yeah. Again, we're not going to talk in detail. There's, there's a lot of happened with Wes Woods and McClaws flanking, you know, um, doing all the stuff he did. But we'll just kind of, at that phase of the battle, if you think about it, things are going pretty well for the Union. 
I mean, yep, they, they have to, they have to win. They yep. took a lot of casualties. They really did. They were lucky because they had their best guys up front. I mean, this wasn't the Harpers Ferry cowards that we talked about last week. This no. was the iron brigade. Um, and they really did a good job pushing back the first Texas the yeah. first the, in the first Texas. That's, that's an all-star team too. That's yep. probably the best the Confederates had. Yep. They were, they were pretty badass. Um, mm-hmm. But there is some stuff that like Jackson is going to come back in the Westwoods. And this is where um, Sumner's got his second core. This is mm-hmm. where my boy, Oliver Otis Howard I was going to ask you where he was. I was going to do. I was going to ask you, hey, where was Oliver? He's in the Westwoods with his Philadelphia brigade. He's a brigade Mm -hmm. commander at that time. He he is in the um, Sedgwick's division, Um, and he's only been commanding these troops for three weeks. Sears does not talk very kindly of Howard in his book, uh, Landscape Uh Turned Red. But I'm not going to (laughs) completely put Sears down for that. You should see her face, how red her face is right now, even talking about someone casting dispersions on the great Oliver Otis Howard right now. <laughs> uh, so the, 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 the troops in the second Corps that are fighting in the Westwoods, Sumner's going to suffer 50% casualties um, when it's oh. all said and done. And so Sumner at this time, he's kind of back a little bit and Jackson is starting to come through and Sumner's not aware of the shitstorm that is about to, um, to hit him. Now, just a side note about Sumner. So his nickname is Bull. And that's because for two reasons. One is because if he had a very booming voice. Uh, the other is because apparently in the Mexican War, he got hit by a musket ball and it like bounced off his head or something like that. He is one of the oldest commanders fighting at Antietam today. He was born in 1797 and he's from Boston. So I know he was a smart guy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Most people from New England are. <laughs> I would agree with that. I would certainly agree with that. Um, so, Present company included. <laughs> so um, Sumner at this time is back with Gorman and he's a quarter mile from where the left and the rear are, are coming under fire right now. And he realizes this and he just says, he's like, by God, we must be out of this. And he just takes off and he takes his hat off and his like white hair is just flowing behind him. And he starts shouting to his, to these men and the men that he's going towards have not been ordered to do anything yet. So they're sitting there, they're like leaning on their, their rifles. Some of them are like, you know, eating breakfast, whatever. They're, they don't have any orders and they see him coming towards them. And because the battle is so loud at this point, they can't hear what he's saying. Well, they just see him and he's like up waving his hat and um, they think he wants them to charge. So they like fix their bayonets and start cheering. And then finally he gets close enough to them and he says, back boys, for God's sakes, move back. You're in a bad fix. And that's when they're like, oh, shit. Um, so there was one guy that after this, after the battle and one soldier who said we were completely flanked on the left. And in two minutes more, we could have been prisoners of war if general Sumner himself had not um, rode in terrific fire of the enemy and brought us off. So Sumner was risking his own life too. Like you think about it, he, he's like, he's a core commander and he just sees that these men are in trouble and he just like takes off Mm -hmm. to try and get them. Um, so that was like one of my like favorite kind of personal stories that I found about this. Just, it's not, I don't think it's one that's often talked about. You don't hear much about the Westwoods and the fighting that went on no. there. And Sumner was not a very popular guy per McClellan too. No. And I think, I don't think it's, it's a reach to say that, that the, the second core out of all the cores, you know, the first, the second, the fifth, the, the sixth, and the, the, uh, the ninth and the 12th, I don't think anybody took more of a beat down than the second core no. because you mentioned before Sedgwick. Okay. But we're going to get to the next phase of this battle, which is the sunken road. And mm-hmm. we'll talk about Israel Richardson and we'll talk about William French. So if you want to talk about just a, a, a tough, tough day. Um, you have the first core, obviously uh, going through the, the, going through the cornfield. Uh, you have a second core, which is going to go to the sunken road. Mm-hmm. So the battle, as it goes on now, it's becoming late morning now, you have the, 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 the cornfield battle settling in a little bit. You know, it looks like things are going to settle down. Um, and then as time goes on, 
it's going to move as the phase is going to slide a little bit south into the east where you're going to see the you're going to see the confederates set up a somewhat of um of a little bit of a gibraltar talking about the um about the sunken road so that's the next part of our story mayor yep there's actually one guy i want to mention though his name i came across it he's in the second core mm -hmm. his name is like he basically when his parents named him it, he he had no choice but to become a soldier his name is napoleon jackson tecumseh dana <laughs> oh. yeah yeah i saw his name too <laughs> I, like, I mean oh my god I mean, if he wanted to be, if he, if he decided to be a dancer, his parents would just jump. Out the his probably. parents were like, "No, no, you want to do what? Excuse me." Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, I want to do a Civil War podcast. No, I want to be a dancer. No, you can't, Napoleon. Napoleon becomes a Dana, you know. But so Sunken Road, we'll talk about Sunken Road because that was another one um, that we talked about before that ultimately. Is you know when you go to when you go to Antietam, you, you can't help but but your eyes get drawn to certain parts of this battle. And the sunken road is certainly one yeah, that's, um, that's that your eyes get automatically focus on yeah. when you see it. Yeah. You know, and and basically, you have basically a bunch of Confederates who are going to be basically in that um, in that. If you've been to Gettysburg, you've seen it. I mean Gettysburg. You've been to Sharpsburg, you've seen it. This is where George Anderson um, and D. H. Hill set up their defense. So if you haven't been there, it's just a, a, a pitch road that's deep that gravity is pulled down that you can, you can basically hide in and you could just pick people off. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool place to go visit actually. But you have, um, on the Confederate, this is back in the second core again, you've got two divisions, one led by William French and you've got one by, by Israel Richardson. And French is gonna be the third division. He's gonna go in first. So he doesn't realize that he's got Jackson's left wing of the army of uh, Northern Virginia there. Basically D.H. Hill, and you're talking about some pretty strong generals. You're talking about Robert Rhodes, George Anderson's, you've got basically Alabamans, and you've got these North Carolinians um, that are all basically there. So you got French troops and they were all green. The first line that went through were green troops and all the Confederates are sitting there waiting for him and they see him bopping up the hill and next, they see the tips of the flags, you see the bayonets. And once they get about a hundred or so yards away, the Confederates open up on them and just mow them down. Um, the Union ends up basically fighting almost a guerrilla-ish type situation where they're firing, going back down the hill on the other side, going back up and firing. Yep, and it's belt, a... They crawl on their bellies, they push themselves along with their elbows. Mm -hmm. So, it, so they're... And they, again, these, these are... These are first guys. This is this is you know guys like Nathan Kimball, brigade commanders like him. Um, so you got some guys. This is this was not unlike the, the cornfield. This was not the Iron Brigade going through. This this was a, a bunch of guys, and they they had a real tough time because of that that really strong defensive position. The the rebels climbed into that lane, um, and it was elbow to elbow. So you have to think the sunken road was a tight fist, um, but they were there, and as it went on. Um, they really took advantage of that defense of that defensive situation, um, and one of the one of the sergeants would yell to the to Confederates, "When you see them, aim for their belt buckles." That's what they said. Yeah, yeah. Personally, I'm not a fan of that. Okay. <laughs> but those are because they would often aim higher for their heads and neck. Right. Exactly. Um, and so basically, uh, what would happen was it, it just it just ended up a bad situation. Uh, the next line that came through is Israel Richardson. Now, this is the one you think, when you think of this, the sunken road, you're, you think of things like the Irish Brigade, and you think of these guys. Um, so this is, this is Thomas Marr coming down. So he's going to be coming along with John Rutterbrook uh, and um, guys like John Caldwell. So this is more of an experienced troop. And now the Union is going is to try to defend them. It's going to try to take this to the sunken road. So fortunately for the Union, um, they, they keep coming. The feds keep, they don't give up. They keep on coming. Um, again, it's very vicious combat. Um, they're able to get around. Um, if, if, you, if, you, if you've been to the sunken road again, it has that observation tower. Yeah. So the New Yorkers would have gone around that area. They probably would have been in the tower. That's probably why they got them. They probably went up there, were shooting right down the line from that tower. That would actually be exactly what they did, to be honest. But they were shooting right down that lane and really that's where you see the Confederate line starting to fall apart. Um, the Rebs start to retreat. 
Um, many of the rebel soldiers are shot in the back running away. So they're actually stopping and turning and shooting because they don't want to get shot in the back. They get forced back. Um, and the feds, from the feds, the federals, they're cheering, huzzah, huzzah. Um, but they're, you know what? They're begging for reinforcements at this point because they got them. They got the rebs on the run now. They're, they're, they're taken off. They basically have them. So um, they're begging McClellan, give us more. The fifth corps, Fitz John Porter is in reserve. They're all there right nearby. They can come on in and they can roll them up and they can call it a day. McClellan says no. He, he, time he says no today. Nope. He sits back and he says, you know something? Um, he sees those casualty report numbers. He sees the, the he sees the cornfield, sees the sunken road, and he says, you know something? We're not going to do it. And that's one thing. We, you know, we've we both defended McClellan at certain things, mm -hmm. um, but um, but I think this is one that's a real real tough time to uh, to get your hands around because it's um it's just it's just very difficult to. Uh, to understand why what he was thinking yeah like i have to say like studying into them a little bit in more detail there are in some ways reasons that i do respect mccallan a little bit more than i used to um especially after listening to uh tattooed historians podcast um he had dan vermilia as an as a guest talking yeah. about yeah, his book, um, That Field of Blood, which is in the Emerging Civil War series. So after I listened to that, like, I kind of saw McClellan in a little bit of a different light regarding this. Um, but yeah, this decision here, I'm kind of like, like, that's, this is the, this is not going to be the first time today he does this, is, is withhold, you know, what he could send to help out, you know. But this was a big one, though. Oh because yeah, you 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 had I me mean, Longstreet. And there's another great story that um that I actually just popped in my head now that I forgot about. Longstreet will actually come back with some troopers, mm -hmm. and his immediate staff mans a gun, a cannon, yeah, and it starts firing on. So Longstreet, just picture Longstreet. You he's know, holding his big beer. I mean, but he's got his he's got his big fake beard holding on, probably, <laughs> you know. Um, but he, but he's, you know, he's having his staff fire this gun. His yeah. soldiers are running. I mean, they're, they're, they're hauling, yeah. or as they would say in the, in the post battle, they retreated with honor, yeah. but they were, they were running. And Longstreet um, was back holding, holding his staff's horses for them. While they did that. He was, and he was, he was, he was holding the horses. So hold your horses. Remember <laughs> that's where that phrase comes from. So you think about the desperation at this very moment. You know, and you go back to the beginning of what there are talk here about how important this battle was really for both, but especially the North. Yeah. Now you're feeling good. Now, okay, we, you know, we, we did well in the cornfields. Um, it was more of a draw kind of, I mean, the, the Rebs kind of came back and pushed them back a little bit. Now you've got this pretty solid victory of the sunken road. And what's interesting is you start to see some of these later generals come out now. Yep. Like we mentioned, Israel Richardson, he gets, he gets wounded here. And so Mac needs a division commander so who does he pick to take over that division oh is that hancock hancock look at oh. you studying <laughs> he picks winfield scott hancock now think about how highly thought of he is in this army okay no yeah. he's you know he has some success and some you know hancock is superb um and all that stuff but he ends up getting in charge of this division so he comes riding up in his horse like he just won the super bowl he's he's all excited right and he starts telling people where to go he the union soldiers are in the sunken road and they're rifling the dead bodies of the confederates yeah. looking for tobacco food hancock you know what he does he Fucking pulls stop his that gun shit. out he pulls out his <laughs> pistol and says, you MFers, I'm gonna, I will use this gun on you if you keep rifling these dead. That's a pretty cool story, though. So now, you know, it just, and again, that comes directly from the battle report, the MFers yeah. thing. Yeah. But, but it just goes to show exactly the type of guy he was. Um, so he's going to take over that. He's going to take over that division. But again, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of good stories. I mean, the days after the battle, there's that story where the old woman rides up in her carriage and she mm. sees all the dead soldiers in the, in the, the pit, uh, you know, rotting and smelling the whole deal. And she, and she gets out of the wagon and she gets on her knees and she prays and she says, Lord, bless the souls who died in the lane. 
And allegedly that's where the phrase bloody lane came from. It was in the Civil War, so. So, you know, so again, things are looking pretty good for the union. Yeah. Now it's around high noon, yeah. right around noon time. So they're going to take a break here. Okay. Yeah. But by noon, the battlefield's silent. Um, you know, what's one that strikes my mind though about, about this the sunken road is you think about guys like John Rudder Brooke and John Caldwell. Yeah. They went through hell at the sunken road. Oh right? yeah. And where were they a year later? Oh. They were in the freaking wheat field at Gettysburg. Yeah. Same guys. God, so, that's the, right so, too. The, so these guys went through the sunken road at Antietam mm -hmm. in the wheat field at Gettysburg. In different positions, you know, but but yeah. still um and it just goes to show, you know, Caldwell was a guy who was called on um in Gibbon's second court at Gettysburg to basically put him through with with Cross and Zook and Brooke yeah. and, and Kelly and all those guys. But this talk about seeing hell. I mean, talk about it. That, up, you know. Yeah, this I, I just some of the you know re, like listening to Fierce Glory, and I mean I've read it too, but just some of the stories that Martin chooses to put in it, like are just it's horrific what these men saw. It's no wonder it never left them. You know. No, and you read stories like with Dawes about the uh, PSTD and all the yeah. issues with these guys and the, the alcoholism. I mean, it's just it's you know, I mean again, like we said before. This wasn't that long ago. It really wasn't. No. You know, if you go to Antietam, we've both been to Antietam. I think yeah. we're going to plan on going to Antietam here soon. Yeah. Is you see what they saw because it's mm -hmm. a, it's pristine. I mean, the battlefield exactly. is it's just, you know, yeah. um, it's just, it's just a really, really great place. And you think about all the stuff they saw. Yeah. Do you want to talk about what happened on the noontime break? Yeah, so around uh, between noon and one o'clock, there's a lull in the battle. And the reason for that is actually because the soldiers had reached exhaustion. You think about it, they've been going like hardcore since about 5.30 in the morning. Eventually your body is like, fuck this, I need to nap. And that's pretty much what happens is there's, there's a lull. So on both sides, the soldiers just kind of sit and they wait to see what else is going to happen. But while they do that, they play chess. They drink coffee, they smoke cigar, or they smoke their pipes, they talk, they laugh. There was one story where these, um, some, this mother pig and her piglets come out of the woods somewhere and start running around. And the mother pig actually runs between the legs of this one guy who's standing up and takes him out. So he's basically riding on this mother pig as she's like running. Um, that was one of the things that I read about. Um, but some of the men actually had checkerboards sewed onto their blankets and they would sit there and play chess when there was a lull in the battle. But the reason for it is not just, you know, cause it's like, okay, what do we do next? We need to wait for orders. It's actually because your body at that point is like, I need a fucking break. Yeah. And this happens many times at Antietam. It's not going to, this is not going to be the first time this happens. This will happen again during the battle where all of a sudden the other side just stops fighting because and if you're out in the field and you see a pig run up, are you not going to ride us? I would. I, I just thought that was so funny. Like she comes out of the woods with her piglets and <laughs> takes out this guy and he's like riding on the back of this pig for a little bit. I'm actually surprised Shelby Foote didn't tell that story. <laughs> I, I just, you know, but that, that's one of the things that we wanted to tell him in, in this episode was just some of the stuff that does happen mm -hmm. during, you know, during this battle and that there is a lull in the battle for a while. But then um, after that, you get to the third phase of the battle. Mm -hmm. Third phase of the battle, the Burnside Bridge, which yep. what a coincidence is named after the guy who fought there. Yeah. You know, but so now you get later in the day and this is again an opportunity when you, when you look on paper and again, we've said this a million times, we'll say it a million more times. We've had 150 years to go back and look at all this shit. Mm -hmm. You know, this stuff happens in real time. You know, we've mentioned that Abner Small diary a million times now about how things happen, don't happen in a panorama. They happen in real time right in front of you. So I don't know if the union really knew that they had them over the barrel. I think they did. I think they yeah. probably realized it. Because again, they're like, holy shit, we're winning. This is like the Browns winning at halftime. Holy shit, what do we do? Let's go home now, right? They're, they're doing really, really well in – you know, they're taking some hard casualties and Mac is, you know, and he misses that golden opportunity to not put Fitzgerald Porter in. And, and that's an unforgivable thing if we really think about it. So the battle continues to roll south and they end up along the Antietam Creek, which is what Burnside Bridge is. So 
Now you're on the right wing. So now you're talking about Long Street's guys. And Long Street's guys are you know, pretty strong guys, but they're heavily outnumbered. You've got about 3,000 guys, um, you know, guys like Robert Toombs, basically all Georgians. And they're manning that little hillside. And you've got Burnside's Ninth Corps, um, and, you're, and he's, he's taken over from Mansfield, who got um, mortally wounded. But he's basically – not Mansfield, who's that Ninth Corps? Um, oh. uh, what the hell is it now? Um, it doesn't matter. Blank on his name. Uh, Burnside's take over the Ninth Corps. So basically he uh, – oh, uh, what's his name? Re, uh, Reno. Yeah. Reno. I was, Reno thinking, was killed at yeah. South Mountain. Yeah. Mans Mansfield was also mortally wounded at Antietam. So before you think I'm crazy, he was. So nope, get off the back. Okay. Anyway, um, so Burnside has about 12,000 guys against like 3,000 Georgians mm -hmm. under Robert Toombs. So it's, it looks pretty good. But what, what do the Georgians have? They're on that military slope of the hill. And the Union has to cross this bridge to get there. Everybody's seen the bridge. It's a beautiful bridge. Burnside's bridge. Um, Toombs is a part of Davy Jones's division. He was I know he, I, crazy. Toombs was. But you know what, though? You know what I found out? He's not the same guy as I was in the Monkeys. Different guy. Different guy. I was waiting for that reference. <laughs> but Toombs is, Toombs is a little bit um, off kilter. I think a lot of these guys were. There's at one, Georgia. One, one point in the bat at the end of the battle where he was like running towards Burnside Bridge, and he's like, "It's not going to be called." Like, it's like this is my bridge. I don't name it if you won that battle. I think it was something I mean, to called... do with him and Jeff Davis too. I think um, Toombs was supposed to actually like he was in the running for president of the Confederacy or something like that. Mm -hmm. No, he, yeah. he was gonna, he was a politician, so he, yeah. he was going to hang out with that. But but the Georgians. Oh my God, my fucking damn thing. But um, the, seriously, but the Georgians. And he says, I'm grumpy when I don't have my coffee in the morning. What? what are you talking about me? You. <laughs> I almost <laughs> burnt my pants with this. Okay. <sighs> oh, a set of problems right here. But so the, the Georgians are on this down, are on the slope. And now you've got Burnside basically um, trying to send across as many guys as he possibly can. This is, this is, this is Wilcox division and, and Samuel Sturgis's division. So they're, they're basically trying to send guys piecemeal over this bridge and it ain't going to happen at least not right away. So it ends up being basically like just a, like a Turkey shoot. They're, they're coming across the Rebs are just pounding and pounding and pounding them. And the Rebs having a great time. These guys come, they get shot. Um, he does send Samuel Sturgis. He tries to send himself to flank around but it doesn't really work out. Finally, he ends up sending the, you know, the, the, the 51st. You heard of them? Yes. The two regiments, 51st Pennsylvania, 51st New York. Yep. Those are the two who go across. Um, and their commander tells them, you guys get across this bridge, I'm going to buy you guys liquor. Yeah, he said that like, they wanted their yeah. whiskey rations, and he's like, he goes, you, get, you get across. You go across, you you're going to get your whiskey. Rations. And they're like, fuck it, let's go. Yep. And you know what happens? They freaking do it. Yep, they do. But doesn't, he get, get, doesn't he get killed, though? I think he does. I think he does, because he he's the first one to go. Yeah. And he gets, like, completely, I think he gets shot in the foot first, mm -hmm. and then the leg, and then the chest. And, like, his men are, like, they help him, but he ends mm -hmm. up dying. I think he passes the way that it pass, Ed, passes Ed, away Ed, the next day. Edward Ferrero. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Edward Ferrero. Yeah. Oh, hell, I thought of that. But anyway, yeah. so, um, so the Georgians have to fall back because now it's attrition. Now the Union sets up a quasi little, I don't know, beachhead's the word, but they set up a little area where now they're on, yeah. the, they're, they're on the Confederate side of the bridge. Um, and now they're basically shooting up with these Georgians. The Georgians, now they're falling back. Um, so now, you got the Confederates on the run again. Because again, you talk about a four to one ratio of guys. Okay. Um, so now Burnside, he's pushed these guys back. He's got a clear road now to Sharpsburg, where if he gets his core to Sharpsburg, he's going to cut off Lee's retreat. And you know what happens then? They got him. Yeah. That's ball game. That's probably, that might be the end of the war right there. So, but in the nick of time, you know what happens? You know what happens. A.P. Hill. A.P. Hill shows up. Fucking A.P. Hill. Hill. Red shirt. Fucking A.P. Hill. So A.P. <laughs> Hill. McClellan's a venereal enemy. <laughs> yeah, vene venereal enemy, literally and figuratively. So, you know, so A.P. Hill has been, he's in Jackson's doghouse. So he gets left behind. He goes, hey, guess what? We're all going to Antietam. You're staying here at Harper's Ferry to guard the prisoners. Yeah. 
AP Hill has probably the best soldiers with him, but he's guarding Harpers Ferry. Yep. Finally, you know, he's, he's like, I'm going, I'm going, we're going, let's go. Yep. Freaking let's go. So you could not make this up. If this was in a movie, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah. Literally at the very moment, at the very possible last moment, here comes AP Hill. Yep. Shows up and says, hi, bitch. And Burnside, <laughs> he probably says, whatever expletive you want to, you want to say on this one when he sees him. Have you ever been at the right place at the right time? Yeah, I have actually. Yeah. You have? Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah. And this time was where AP Hill was because he gets there at the absolute time. He, he completely surprises Burnside, stalls him in his, in his friggin' tracks. You, it's an absolute miracle. And if you think about it, because of this, the Confederates are going to jump ahead of the story here, but the Confederates are going to be able to escape. You can make a case that AP Hill kept the war going for two more years himself you could yeah because he doing shows that. up yeah because if he you hadn't know? shown up and like this the fact it's ap hill is hilarious when you know like some of the back things that are going on oh, there let's let's talk about ap hill for yes. a second old, old ambrose old powell okay <laughs> why did he leave harper's ferry he had three reasons why he left Harper's Ferry, and they were all hilarious. Yeah, the first he's one. He's pissed off at Jackson, right? Yep, he's pissed at Jackson because Jackson accuses him of, if I can say this word right, dereliction of dirt duty. <laughs> I say dereliction, but I can say duty right. Story of my life. The dereliction of dirty. So he's he's in trouble. He's he's going to get. He's basically. Um, he's been arrested so he wants to redeem himself he's like i'm gonna show you know i'm gonna be the hero the second one is 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 probably my favorite one um and this is mary ellen marcy mm, and yes, as we know anybody anybody named mary is bad news first of all we know this <laughs> but especially this one okay so ap hill and george mcclellan are roommates at west point ap hill is engaged to mary mary ellen Okay. Yep. He asked, you know how many times he asked her to, him, her to marry him? It's quite a few. Nine times. And you, can, you can throw in your Ferris Bueller. Nine times. Nine th That's how many times she was proposed to by age 25. Wow. So she finally says yes, but her father doesn't want anything to do with A.P. Hill. Maybe no, and, not, it, and neither does you know. the mother. And the mother no. was a gossip. And A.P. Yep. Hill went to New York City one weekend and he apparently got gonorrhea and her mother finds out about it and she like did this kind of whisper smear campaign about him so next thing you know like they're not fucking engaged anymore yeah gonorrhea usually kills most relationships i think yeah but i, I still, actually it I was think, just I think, it was like oh my I think god going to new york itself would kill a relationship yeah. throw gonorrhea in there my god how, how was your trip well it was but, pretty good except for the gonorrhea like what a shit show she's spreading gossip about him <laughs> i mean so so that, so guess, guess what's gonna happen they ain't gonna get married you know who she's gonna marry george McClellan. george McClellan. so ap hill he's pissed his former college roommate scoops his fiance and i was married to her so now he wants to go and he wants to show him, I guess, his manness or whatever his phrase is, his bravado, whatever he wants to do. He's going to show it to him. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to his basically take, rival. he's going to show him his venereal rival. Okay. So he's going to basically want to do that for that reason. The third reason, which is kind of funny too, is Burnside owes him $8,000. That's right too. He owes him eight <laughs> grand. So he's thinking, I'm going to go beat Burnside's ass. Otherwise, I'm not going to get my money. You know, bitch, oh, bitch, where's my money? You know? <laughs> That's why he shows up. Hi, bitch. Hey, bitch. So he's, he's mad at Jackson. He's pissed off because he's a, a scorned lover, whatever you want to call it is. And he's going to get money. So yeah. women, money, and pride. And he right? shows up in his red plaid shirt and his Always. ham bone in his pocket because he carries a ham bone okay, for good luck with his mother. You're, you're <laughs> no. embarrassing the children again, Mary. His mother gave him a ham bone to carry in his pocket for good luck. I don't, I don't think I need to hear the rest of this story. <laughs> so could he's you, such I mean, an eccentric dude. Like he's just, I mean, this is the one thing that's fun about studying this is when you like dig deep and you find out this shit's hilarious. How can you hate a guy who carries around a ham bone in his pocket though? <laughs> think about him and where's that plaid shirt all the time he is basically like the confederate version of barlow with that shirt oh exactly he hits exactly what he is he's um he wants he's he's just 
God. But basically, it's at the end of the day, what's going to happen with this, it's going to be a huge missed opportunity for the union. It's going to end up a situation where the, um, the opportunity is there. They get a win, sort of. It's basically a tie. But at the end of the day, the Confederates escape. And it's just a, it's a big loss. And guess who's pissed off? Lincoln. Mm, yeah. Dare I say Lincoln, right? He's pissed off because he decides, Mac decides he's, they've had enough. And he actually escapes. Yeah. He's going to also, he's going to take off and it's going to end up as a, it's going to end up a big deal. And it's going to end up basically eventually going to cost him his job is what yeah. it's going to be. And we're going to do mm. an episode about, um, about the uh, kind of the letters that get exchanged in that period of time, as well as oh. the visit. I wonder if there'll be text messages. Ooh, there might be. And we might talk about that picture in the tent too. You know, oh yeah. Paul and her sitting in the tent. You know, so, <laughs> I think I'm kind of talk about that. So, <laughs> so Lee, Lee's sitting back for the next morning. You know, there's that little truce they have in the morning to bury the bodies. They have yes. that whole thing, right? Yes. And Lee's waiting for Mac to attack. It never comes. So Lee gets to retreat. He gets to go back. Um, Lincoln gets mad. But you know what happens for, for, for Lincoln, though? He feels this is justified. No, he can release his Emancipation Proclamation. Yep. So a couple of days later, on the 22nd of September, which is the anniversary of today, yep. he is going to release his preliminary proclamation where he's going to say god has a side of this question in favor of the slaves is a quote he's going to say and he's going to basically say this freed this war now is about a battle over freedom and the end of slavery which not all union guys are going to really appreciate but it's going to um it's going to issue the emancipation proclamation yeah now a lot of people talk about that and what does it mean i mean let's it it doesn't really mean anything it no. really does it it's like the declaration of independence it's a cool bravado thing but there's nothing behind it it just basically says he's going to use his war powers to confiscate property, quote, slaves, in, in basically in the South, even though he has yeah. no jurisdiction over them at that point. Um, it only really frees the slaves in rebel-controlled states, but that doesn't really but – but the point is now this war is about slavery. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, you mentioned before um, you know, you mentioned before about, about England coming back now and saying, you know what, we, we, we can't do this. It's, it's, it, it settles it – settles the, the, the issue of, of in turn of the uh, international thing because Palmerston is going to write that letter. He's going to think about it. And then once he finds out that the emancipation proclamation is issued, that's it. Everything, yep. everything stops. So yep. it's a game changer. Yeah. I think it's a game changer mm -hmm. in the civil war. It's what causes the shift into people really realizing that this war is about slavery. And I think that's one of the reasons why Antietam is the most important victory in the civil war. Well, I, I think it is. I think for a million different reasons, yeah. um, I, I think it is. You know, so, so he's going to be able to issue his Emancipation Proclamation. It's not going to do much. I mean, Lee, it's, Lee is still going to have his success. I mean, mm -hmm. now we're heading into the end of 1862 where you're going to get into Fredericksburg. Um, October 2nd is when Lincoln goes to Antietam, I believe. I think that's the date he goes. Thing. Right around there. Um, and he basically says, I need for you to get on your ass and fucking go get him. And my horses are tired. Basically, basically, my horses are tired. And he's going to touch his nose. He's going to say, not it. He doesn't want to do it. Whether it is he wants to let the self down easy or he doesn't want to. I, I'm not sure what, what was going on in his head. But, but Lincoln says, all right, well, guess what? Fucking done. Well, we can't yeah. do this anymore. So he goes to Burnside, who he had offered the command to earlier. Yep. Burnside takes over. That's a conversation for another day, but it's not going to end well for old Burnsy. You know, and that's going to be the end of it. So, um, I mean, the epitaph of it was, was you had 23,000 casualties, mm -hmm. which was nine times the number of Normandy casualties yep. in D-Day. Um, it's the single bloodiest day in American history. So you're talking yep. about, you know, 12,000 U.S. casualties, about another 11,000, 12,000. It was pretty even. I think tactically it's probably a tie. Mm -hmm. But Lincoln is, Lincoln is going to say, well, you know what? We stopped their invasion. We pushed them back. They're yes. going home. We're going to take the W. Yes. He's probably right. He's probably right. I, I think in his eyes, it was a victory. I mean, I've seen, you know, read articles where it says like, oh, it was just a draw. And others that say it was a victory. I think it, it, it needs to be seen as a victory um, because of the emancipation, because it was a turning point in the Civil War. 
um, you know, like we are looking at the most important victory because without it, things would have gone so differently, you know? And again, that's just, that's just like, I think we both agree about that. That's just our opinion. You know, someone else has another battle that they think is the important one. Then, then that's awesome too. Like that's, what's great about studying the civil war is. The battle of Shrewd farm was a big one. Yeah. I don't watch the office <laughs> yet. You like my tweet today about it though. Of course I did. Well, okay, fine. But in any case, <laughs> but, but the thing about, about Antietam though, is it keeps coming back. I mean, you know, you talk about 2000, June, um, January 2009, they found some remains there mm -hmm. of a soldier, from a New York soldier. Yeah. Somebody was by the cornfield and there was a gopher hole or a groundhog hole and the dog pulled a bone out and they found buttons and a belt buckle. Jesus. They, they found that they found the uh, full, like almost like a jawbone, um, basically almost a full skeleton of, of a New York soldier wow. who f was someone in the cornfield. Wow. Um, and he was, he was moved. I assume he was moved to the, the National Cemetery where most yeah. of the guys were. But that wasn't that long ago. That was about 10 years ago. Yeah. And then, and then just a couple of months ago, they found this new Elliott map section. Remember that? That's, yep. The burial map where they found basically there was an additional 6,000 soldiers and like 270 horses were buried mm -hmm. in this extra area. And now they're yeah. talking like, holy shit, there was way more dead than we ever thought at the cornfields. This, mm -hmm. It, it, it kind of jacked the numbers up a little bit. So Antietam is one of those battles that keeps coming back. And I think it's the, the Civil War gods reminding us that as much as, look, no one loves Gettysburg more than me. Yep, but I think, we have to, I think we have to understand that Antietam is probably going to ultimately be, in hindsight, and again, using 2020 vision, it stopped a really bad political situation. It's, it, it emboldened Lincoln's with the Emancipation Proclamation. Yep. It pushed Lee back. It broke his string of success. He went and licked his wounds, and he would come back and have success later on. But it helped the uh, midterm elections in Lincoln's yeah, favor. Absolutely. Um, it did continue the war for a couple more years, probably yeah. because of Hill. You know, yeah. so every time you wear a red shirt, think about that. You know, always with that red shirt. You know, there was a kid I knew in high school always wore a red shirt. As I think about it now. Yeah. Well, like that's, I say, that's, he's kind of like the Barlow. The, he's like the Barlow of the Confederacy with that red shirt. Yeah, Barlow's always his little plaid. His, yeah. His, I have that same shirt, by the way, matter of fact. Barlow. But I, but I think, you know, you look at the final casualty numbers, it's, it's the bloodiest day in American history. Yeah. They've got that great luminary display they have, which mm -hmm. I think is in December. I think it's later. I don't think it's – it's. Um, yeah, it's in December. Ask. It's in December. We might have to Civil War Breakfast Club road trip there some December to see it. That'd be fun. What about they do it in December? They don't do it on the anniversary. I don't know. I, I got someone. You don't have to ask Price that. I know. She'll know. Yeah. yeah. Jay Price will know. Jay Price. She's Currently our go-to. Yeah. She's our go-to Antietam girl. And she's in Antietam right now, right? She is. Yeah. She posted a picture bet. of the moon for me. I saw that. I saw that. I saw that was, uh, I was, I was, Pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Um, she's probably sitting in that bar right now, as a matter of fact. She probably is. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> but but I think you know the end of the story is a great a great win for the Union. Yeah. Um, really a missed opportunity for the South, but mm -hmm. really a missed opportunity for McClellan because he had the two yeah. the two biggest mistakes. And you know we make fun of his Mary Math and we make fun of his you know all the stuff he does, the, the slow McClellan and all that stuff. But his, his, his two biggest mistakes were probably here at Antietam. They I really think so, were, yeah. Just not you know? get – because Burnside, the second, the second thing that happened is Burnside, he asked for more men and he asked for, for more ammo. And McCullen came back and basically was like, no, you're not fucking getting it. Sorry. You, you need to hold this bridge and you got to you, – you better hold it at all, all costs. Like he, he just flat out refused to give Burnside anything. And that's, I think, when their friendship ended because Burnside thought – I think Burnside was thinking like, okay, I'm friends with this guy, you know, he's my roommate, whatever, you know, like they lived together for a period of time. Um, no, he didn't get it. So I think just McClellan, I think got into back into his overcautious way that he was, you know, he's an incredible organizer. He was, I think, able to create the AOP that went into Antietam and fought as hard as they did. I think McClellan created that because of who yeah. he, because of who he was but when it came to time to make decisions because by the time he got burnside's request 
um, one of his staff said that that was when McClellan kind of started to break. Like he realized he's like, oh my God, this is bad. Like this is really, really bad. So I think he started to get into that like overcautious, getting scared. We can't have more men killed moment. I think, I think it was partially that. I think he was, he was afraid of that. I think he also, part of him didn't want to punish the self. Mm -hmm. I think I think part of him wanted to, to he wanted to obviously win the war, but I think he wanted to win it with like a soft hand. What's the phrase? I'm yeah, like, I, I think he I just just think he wanted to like beat them, but not humiliate them. Yes. And I, I think for whatever reason he didn't get the memo yet that at that point it wasn't going to happen. You it, it just was it just wasn't feasible. And I think I think not sending in Porter his, his fifth corps to chase Longstreet at the sunken road. Yeah. Um, or chase those guys the sunken road dh hill i mean um I, I think that was a big mistake and then of course not um not chasing lee because he had he had oh, yeah him, yeah know. and then too just not just what he did to burnside too is is another thing right there you know it just it's showing that there's the mcclellan that can organize the army which is amazing he's he's very talented at that that's where i've come to respect him um more but then there's the mcclellan that when the battle is happening mm -hmm. He's not able to make the decisions that need to be made because you think if someone like Hooker had been in there, somebody a little bit more aggressively, you know, how would it, how would it have possibly been different? It could have been very different. Hooker probably it's would different. have sent those men into the sunken road. You know who did come to get Antietam at the end? Was Gardner. That's right. Yep. Photography. Now we First. talked about this. We talked about this, I think this morning, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, he takes those pictures. He brings the basically brings the dead back home. Yeah. Is what they said. He sets up his cameras. You know, he's, he works for Matthew Brady, and they take the, the basically the first dead battlefield pictures of mm -hmm. the Civil War. Yeah, and really anywhere, anywhere really. And so the American population is now seeing the, these dead soldiers for the first time. Yep, and he puts and it on display in New York. And New York City mortifies the country, mortifies them. And we were talking before how important Antietam was the likelihood what might have happened in the north of public opinion if they lost that battle badly like at Manassas II and then you saw these dead soldiers. How does that affect the morale of the north who was already waning anyway? Yep. These are the things you think about when, when people talk and we were talking on Twitter about how people didn't think Antietam was the most important and blah, blah, blah. But when you look at what could have happened if they lost, what, what followed from that, I don't think they survived this. I think if they lose this battle, um, I think I think that's that's the writing on the wall. I think it's yep. over. I think so too. I think that's pretty pretty much yep. it. So yeah, and the photos would have just been the the final thing that they all, all they need to see is like, oh, look at these photos from what we lost. You know. I think I think it, it was it was it would have been bad. I think it would have been, but yeah, but but I think um, you know a lot of cool stories come out of this battle. It's one of those. Yep. Antietam, like we said before, is one of those words. It just you say the word Antietam, it just it just it just is a powerful word for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's just a cool word if you if you don't even study the battle. It's just a, just a neat word. But if you yep. study the battle, um, it, it's a sullen word. It's it's a powerful word, and I think it's uh, it's one that I think more people need to um, need to focus on. Love Gettysburg. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I love it love, too. Gettysburg, love you, mean it. I really do. But I think when you're looking at it strategically. Gettysburg is probably doesn't happen if Antietam doesn't work out the way it does. Yep. And, and all Gettysburg was really was what Lee wanted to do the year before. He, he decided to try it again. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, no, sim I agree. Similar, with you. similar results. Yep. yep. Um, so I just, one thing I want to touch on, um, there was a couple things we didn't get to tonight that I think we'll talk about on our Facebook Live. Our Facebook Lives are basically becoming the point five of these episodes because there are stuff that we don't, we don't get to because we don't want these episodes to be like two hours long. Um, so the one thing that I'm definitely going to talk about on Saturday morning is Clara Barton. Because she's, oh, yeah. here, she's here at the Battle of Antietam. Um, I wanted to get to her, like, I was going to try and get to her in the episode tonight. But, you know, we were like, I mean, awesome discussion as always. And then I just thought, I'm like, no, you know what? I'll save Clara for, for the Facebook Live on Saturday morning. Um, you know, the other thing I want to talk about, too, is kind of the, this is one of the first battles where, you have the triage system being set up for the treatment of soldiers when they're wounded. And that is a really interesting aspect of this battle. And it was actually one of the first cases I think where there was like 
what they called the triage system set up by one of the surgeons. They, they did it on both sides. But there's a few more stories that Darren and I can definitely talk about on Saturday morning. And we hope that um, a few of you <laughs> will join us for that and maybe talk, maybe we can get a discussion going about how you view the battle of Antietam. You know, do you see it as being the most important battle? And, and if not, like, what do you see as being the most important battle? Because I think these are great discussions to have in the Civil War field, um, just to kind of, like, I mean, we, we come away learning more about the battles because we have those discussions, right? So. I, I think it's, it's a great opportunity to talk about it because what's yeah. funny about it is, is, you know, is dusting off the old Antietam memory again and mm -hmm. just remembering some of the stuff. And I, you know, I was there about a month or so ago um, so you get to see it again. So it's, it's kind of fresh in my memory, but if, if you haven't been to Antietam, um, it's only an hour and a half away from Gettysburg. You can, if, if you go, people, go to Antietam, go to Harper's Ferry on the way back, stop at Antietam Brewery. Yep. Okay. Get some little Mac IPA. Little Mac IPA. One million exactly. IBUs. And it takes forever to drink. But, and then go back to Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. do, do yourself a favor. Think of me. Yep. Well, I think that's enough for one night, Mary. I think we're done tonight. I think that's a pretty good yep. episode. I, th I think um, I think we have uh, I don't, I don't have damage tonight, I think. I think we're pretty I good. So. But I think um, yep. any party words from the um, great white north? <laughs> Just uh we'll be doing the Facebook, this episode will drop around eight o'clock on Saturday morning. And um, we will be doing our Facebook live around 10 o'clock and we will be talking Antietam. And like I said, I'm going to bring, talk about Clara Barton and kind of the medical, a little bit more about the medical side of it. Um, I definitely will be hitting record on that because I do kind of see these Facebook lives as becoming like our 0.5 episode of stuff that we might not have got to talk about in this episode. So yes, mm -hmm. those are my parting thoughts. Oh, also thank you to all of our listeners and our community on Twitter and um, Facebook and Instagram, especially the, the community on Twitter is really, really fun. Um, really, really awesome people on there. Get some great discussions going. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, great to, uh, great to see you again, Mary. I look forward to the next time we talk about, say it, you want to Ch say it. Chickamauga. Chickamauga. <laughs> We're going to be dealing, and I'm going to bet, I'm going to guess, I will bet you a nickel that you are going to talk about Wilder and Minty. Of course I am. I bet you are. I bet you are. Wilder, so Minty, The Rock, Lytle. All of them. All of them. Hill bumbling around in the fucking forest. <laughs> <laughs> Bragg being a drama queen. I think it would be a great idea for people watching this at home. Every time... Hey, don't don't tell Mary. Every time she says Snodgrass, take a drink of beer and see what happens. Civil War Breakfast Club drinking game. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. it's we'll uh, we'll look forward to talking to you soon. Have a great night. Thanks for everybody for watching again. Facebook Live. Be there or be square. Ten o'clock in the morning on Saturday. We, we're going to be up. Might as well be too. Something else yep. going on. Come, come hang with us, and we will talk and finish up and put the finishing touches on the Battle of Antietam and look ahead to the Battle of Chickamauga. Yes. Anyway, have a good Saturday, everybody, and we will see you all next week. Good night, everybody. Peace out. Yep.